Welcome to the Poets Theatre and this unique event for us. Um, we are here to have one of our annual musters of poets. And the people you see on either side of me are the ones who are going to be paying tribute to Edna Longley and Michael Longley, who've come here from Belfast. And the occasion for that is that Edna Longley has just been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She will be inducted later this week at the Academy, and so will her husband, Michael. Michael has been a member of the Academy. He was voted in years ago, but he was never here in person to be inducted. So the Academy has agreed to do a husband and wife induction, <laughs> and um, we're all extraordinarily happy to have them here. My name is Bob Scanlon. I'm the Artistic Director of the Poets Theatre. I think I've inherited the title of president of the board as well. Uh, we are an organization that was founded in 1950 by um, many poets, all of them classmates at Harvard at the time. But Richard Wilbur was central to the creation of the Poets Theater. And Richard Wilbur was instrumental in our reviving the Poets Theater recently one of its many revivals. It keeps dying and reawakening. It's uh, the phoenix of theaters. But the poets at that time, and Richard told me, Dick Wilbur as we called him, he would drive in from Covington and have lunch with us and give us some guidance about the Poets Theater as well as history about its past. And um, he told us when we were our latest revival, when David Goulet, who's on the far right there, and, and I revived the theater once again, um, he said, remember that we were founded with a vengeance, and keep that edge, please. And um, we took that to heart. Our first production uh, five years ago now, six years ago, was um, Under Milkwood, which is one of the great triumphs of the Poets Theatre, um, because in the early days of the Poets Theatre, early 50s, Dylan Thomas came over and joined the Poets Theatre, wrote Under Milkwood in Cambridge, and premiered it. Um, at, uh, at, um, our, on our venues. Therefore, we feel that we have a really strong legacy and it comes full circle to this gallery of poets who are all members of the Poets Theatre, have worked with the Poets Theatre in the past. But Robert Pinsky on the far left, uh, who will speak after me. Um, we, he and I did Dante together. It was a long process when um, Robert's translation of the uh, Inferno came out. And I would like to, at this point, point out how appropriate this room is. It's even more appropriate when the sun is shining behind us. Because these stained glass windows represent um, epic poetry. And directly behind me is Dante. These central panels, which you can't see right now because they're not backlit. But they are, in fact, the three canto, canticles of the, uh, of the Divine Comedy. And obviously reminiscent of the many years that we spent doing that. Um, and um, on the far right panels, take my word for it, is Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey right next to each other. And in the far lower right-hand corner, is actually depicted a scene which is exactly the scene of one of Michael's most famous poems in Ireland, Ceasefire. And it shows Priam kneeling at the feet of Achilles. And the line in um, Ceasefire is, I get down on my knees and do what must be done. I kiss Achilles' hand, the killer of my son. Um, Michael gets a little tired of that being the, the best known poem that he's written, but in fact you're going to hear a series of tributes from a series of us, you have a program in front of you, um, that is in fact our way of expressing how much Michael and Edna both mean to us. And um, Edna is a poetry critic and a 
public intellectual in Ireland of enormous importance. And Michael as a poet who's touched every single one of us um, in some way or other. And in my particular case, um, he's become a really close friend in the last two years since I've been part of the Boston Belfast Sister Cities program. And the poem I'd like to read um, is not by Michael, but it's for Michael, and it's written by Frank Ormsby, one of the other poets, along with Seamus Heaney and Paul Muldoon and Kieran Carson, um, who make up that extraordinary group called the Belfast Poets. And um, this poem, self-explanatory, is called The Hooper Swan. And maybe later in the evening, after we've drink a bit more, you can get Michael to do the Hooper Swan. When you croon your impression of a Hooper Swan at lunchtime, sotto voce, in Flanagan's bar, the notes are beyond language. You are living that sound by tidal shallows a hundred miles away, in a season part voiceless until the swans return. A moment's silence. I imagine each dolorous yomp as a bid for the true pitch, as though it's deferred to a loch's memory of winter or the last death on an island. Yet even in autumn lifts a bronchial trump of resurrection. When dawn was a soundless birth and sunset mimed the idea of loss, the whooper happened in with the vowel to suit October in these parts, a tone that made somehow bearable the wind's insistent dismissals, its miserly null and void. Though earthbound, landlocked, I never lacked till now the gift of a coastal childhood or missed a life edged with Atlantic. Sea self, sky self, land self, among the dunes in late autumn, balance restored by the rich plaint, the vibrant ochon of the hooper swan. The next reader will be Robert Pinsky. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm going to read a translation that is a great work of art. I believe that Michael Longley's translation of the Baucus and Philemon episode from Ovid's Latin. It's a great poem that shows what translation is at its best. It's not just going from one, it's not carrying across from one language to another. It involves the plural cultures that Ovid knew, the plural cultures that the poet Longley knows. And it's not merely taking Phrygian peasants and making them into Irish peasants. It's understanding the languages and horrors of culture itself, so that the gods in the poem, arrogant, vengeful, punitive, ultimately provincial, lack the culture that the old modest couple have, which is based on kindness, respect, communal feeling. Baucus and Philemon, after Ovid. In the Phrygian hills, an oak tree grows beside a lime tree, and a low wall encloses them. Not far away, not far away lies Bogland. I've seen this spot myself. It should convince you, if you need to be convinced, that the power of heaven is limitless, that whatever the gods desire gets done. Where a drowned valley makes a sanctuary for water birds, divers, coots, a whole community used to plow until Jupiter brought Mercury without his sword, wand, or wings. Disguised as humans, they knocked at a thousand houses looking for lodgings. A thousand houses slammed the door. But one house took them in. 
a cottage thatched with straw and reeds from the bog. Baucis and Philemon, a kindly old couple, had been married there when they were young, and growing old together there found peace of mind by owning up to their poverty and making light of it. Pointless to look for masters or servants here because wife and husband served and ruled the household equally. So when these sky dwellers appeared at their cottage home, stooping under the low door to get in, the old man brought them stools to sit on, the old woman cushions. She raked the warm ashes to one side and fanned into life yesterday's embers, which she fed with leaves and dry bark the breath from her old body puffing them into flames. She hoked around in the roof space for twigs and firewood, broke them up, and poked the kindling under her skillet. She took the cabbage which Philemon had brought her from the garden plot and lopped off the outer leaves. He lowered a flitch of smoked bacon from the sooty rafters and carved a reasonable helping from their precious pork, which he simmered in bubbling water to make a stew. They chatted to pass the time for their hungry visitors and pointed into a beechwood bucket dangling from its peg and poured warm water so the immortals might freshen up. Over a sofa, its feet and frame carved out of willow, drooped a mattress lumpy with sedgegrass from the river. On this they spread a coverlet, and the gods sat down. The old woman tucked up her skirts with shaky hands, placed the table in front of them. Because one leg was short, she improvised a wedge and made the surface level before she wiped it over with a sprig of water mint. She put on the table speckly olives and wild cherries pickled in wine, endives, radishes, cottage cheese, and eggs. Gently cooked in the cooling ashes, all served on crockery. Next, she produced the hand-decorated wine jug and beechwood cups, polished inside with yellow wax. In no time, meat arrived from the fireplace piping hot, and the wine, a rough and ready vintage, went the rounds until they cleared the table for a second course. Nuts and figs and wrinkly dates, plums and sweet-smelling apples in a wicked basket, purple grapes fresh from the vines. The centerpiece was a honeycomb, oozing clear honey, and over everything the circle of convivial faces and the bustle of hospitality. And then the hosts noticed that the wine jug, as soon as it was emptied, filled itself up again, an inexhaustible supply. This looked like a miracle to Philemon and Baucis, who, waving their hands about as if in prayer or shock, apologized for their home cooking and simple recipes. They had just one gander, guardian of their small holding, whom they wanted to sacrifice for the divinities. But he was too nippy for them and flapped out of danger into the immortals' arms. Don't kill the goose, they thundered. <laughs> We're gods. <laughs> Don't kill the goose. We're gods. Your tight-fisted neighbors are about to get what they deserve. You two are granted immunity. Abandon your home and climb the mountainside with us. Such assholes. Unsteady on their walking sticks, they struggled up the steep slope, and glancing back a stone's throw from the top, they saw the townland flooded with just their homestead high and dry. While they stood flabbergasted, crying out for neighbors, their cottage, a squeeze for the two of them, became a church. Stone pillars took the place of the homemade wooden piles. The thatching glowed so yellow that the roof looked golden. Filigree transformed the doorway, and marble tiling improved the dirt floor. Jupiter spoke like a gentleman. Grandpa, if you and your good wife could have one wish, 
May we work as vergers in your chapel. And since our lives have been spent together, please, may we die together, the two of us at the one time. I don't want to see my wife buried or be buried by her. Their wish came true. And up to the last moment, they looked after the chapel. At the end of their days, when they were very old and bowed and living on their memories, outside the chapel door, Baucis, who was leafy too, watched Philemon sprouting leaves. As treetops overgrew their smiles, they called in unison, Goodbye, my dear. Then the bark knitted and hid their lips. Two trees are grafted together where their two bodies stood. I add my flowers to, bouquet, to bouquets in the branches by saying, treat those whom God loves as your local gods, a blackthorn or a standing stone. Take care of caretakers and watch over the night watchman and the night watchman's wife. Beautifully read, Robert. I'm David Gallette, the literary director of the Poets Theater. It's a great joy to be here. We want to give a special thanks to the Burns Library and to Christian DuPont for inviting us here, and also the Irish Studies Program at Boston College, which has sort of become for me a second home. It's a lovely, lovely place to be, and a great place to celebrate the Longleys. I'm going to read three short things. First is a poem of my own, which picks a kind of false jocular quibble with Seamus Heaney. In one of his essays, uh, Seamus writes, finding a voice means that you get your own feelings into your own words, and that your words have the feel of you about them. Here's my response. Precociously picaresque, the poet sets out in search of a journey. He is every soul he meets and fights and kisses. He's no more himself than a bird is an egg. He borrows words but eats them without remorse. His song is all the top 40 played at once. His words have the hand-me-down feel of his alias brother crying farewell from the field where Gramps and Granny clasp in the gene pool, stitching the sails of light. And whenever he finds his voice, he flips the page, looks both ways, and opens the door of its cage. By the way, I have to say that uh, our son, Sean Leland Sebastian Collette, who, like all young people, live in Brooklyn, New York, lives in Brooklyn, New York with his family, uh, I mentioned that we were going to be paying a tribute to Michael and Edna Long Ed Longley. He said, well, you know, I talked my way into Seamus Heaney's poetry class my freshman year over at Harvard, and pretty much all Seamus did was to praise Michael Longley. He'd have us uh, prepare a poem. One person would be selected to read it aloud, and everyone else would scribble notes while it was being read. So Michael Longley's name looms large in my son's legend, even though he's never met Michael, unfortunately. That will change. We'll come to Ireland, make it happen. I'm going to read a poem of Michael's about the birth of his nephew, Christopher, called Christopher at Birth. Your uncle, totem and curator, bends above your cot. It is you I want to see. Your cry comes out like an eleison. Only the name tag round your wrist extends my surprised compassion to loyalty. Your mother tells me that you are my godson. 
The previous room still molds your shape, which lies unwashed, out of its element, smelling of rain and soil. I stoop to lift you out of bed and into my landscape. Last arrival, obvious immigrant, wearing the fashions of the place you left. As winds are balanced in a swaying tree, I cradle your cries, and in my arms reside, till you fall asleep, your uncontended demands that the world be your nursery. And I, spokesman of that world outside, creation's sponsor, stand dumbfounded. Although there is such a story to unfold, whether it's forecast or reminder of cattle steaming in their byres and sheep beneath a hedge arranged against the cold, our cat at home blinking by the fender, and the wolf treading its circuits towards sleep. Finally, I didn't know Bob was going to read his poem by Frank Ormsby. I didn't know Frank Ormsby until a week ago. Got his book, and it was, he's now my favorite poet, after Michael Longley, of course. This is, a, this is a poem by Frank Ormsby, who is now the professor of poetry in Ireland, which is the equivalent of the poet laureate. He spends three years going from UCD to TCD to Queen's College, Queen's University, excuse me. And every once in a while, he has lunch, um, uh, lunch with Michael Longley in a place called The Crown. This is called Lunch in the Crown with Michael Longley by Frank Ormsby, O-R-M-S-B-Y. Read him. Autumnal light kindles the goddess Fortuna on a stained glass window. First snug on the right, bangers and mash, and an exchange of new poems. Our 30-year friendship enjoys, at last, a post-war ripening. Though we are perhaps too quick to award ourselves the medal of perseverance, because we stayed through decades of others' bloodshed and plied our trade in offices and classrooms. We've kept the poems coming for what they're worth, Add small stones to the cairns of love and sorrow. Rejoice in whatever has not been blown to pieces. Have we any choice but to go on greeting the birth of grandchildren with a poetry of prayers and wishes? Or sit down in peacetime under Fortuna to eat and talk so it's bangers and mash again with sweet gravy, elemental pig and potato stuff that keeps us grounded. Next, the ritual exchange of poems. Mine, a ten-liner about boyhood in which my father dies for the 15th time. Yours, a three-line epic on a mayo otter crossing the door. Words that have kept you sleepless half the night. Frank Ormsby. <laughs> Next, we have the remarkable Amanda Gann, whom I recall, I, I adapted Seamus' uh, translation of uh, Beowulf, and we did it for a full week at the Cambridge Multicultural Arts Center and here is Queen Welchthel, Hrothgar's queen herself, to read for you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Michael and Edna. Uh, I, I first met very briefly Michael and Edna both when they uh, graciously 
came to see a Poets Theatre performance of uh, Beckett Women at the MAC in Belfast, and they endured a 10-foot projection of my mouth uh, speaking uninterruptedly for 30 minutes and then uh, had nothing but nice things to say afterward. So that tells you what kind of people they are. I uh, am going to read a, a poem of Michael's, and uh, as someone who is, is only now myself starting to write, I find it absolutely terrifying to be speaking of the words of someone who's in front of me. Uh, luckily, Samuel Beckett uh, was not there that night, but I don't know how well I did. Uh, so thank you. I'm honored. Um, I would like to relate briefly a story that, uh, that Bob Scanlon told me about this poem. Uh, when he gave a seminar in, in Belfast, he wanted to pair this poem, uh, which was given to Seamus Heaney with one of uh, Seamus Heaney's poems uh, given to Michael Longley, and he found the content so incommensurate that he couldn't make them go together. And I think there's uh, not a better testament to any friendship uh, that two people give each other much, but it's never the same thing. So, a personal statement. Since you, mind, think to diagnose experience as summer, satin, nightingale, or rose, of the senses making sense. Follow my nose, attend all other points of contact, deserve your birth. My brainchild, help me find my own way back to fire, air, water, earth. I am, in fact, more than a bag of skin and bone. My person is a chamber where the elements postpone in lively synthesis, in peace on loan. Old wars of flood and earthquake, storm and holocaust, their attributes most temperately reformed of heat wave and of frost. They take my form. Learn from my arteries their pace. They leave alarms and excursions for my heart and lungs to face. I hold them in my arms and keep in place. To walk, to run, to leap, to stand. Of the litany of movement, I, the vicar in command, the prophet in my country, the priest at hand, take steps to make it understood. The occupants assembled here in narrow neighborhood are my constituents for bad or good. Body and mind, I turn to you. It's me you fit. Whatever you think, whatever you do, include me in on it, essential to. Who house philosophy and force? Wed well in me the elements, for fevers their divorce, nightmare and ecstasy and death, of course. My sponsor, mind, my satellite, keep my balance. Steer me through my heyday, through my night, my senses, common sense, self-centered light. And you who set me in my ways, immaculate, in full possession of my faculties, till you disintegrate, exist to please. Lest I with fears and hopes capsize, by your own lights sail body cargoless towards surprise, and come, mind, raise your sights. Believe my eyes. The next reader will be the inimitable Lloyd Shorts. Uh, thank you, um, Amanda. Um, thank you for being here. And um, Bob, thank you for inviting me to participate in, uh, in, this, in this event. Um, uh, I um, uh, don't want to congratulate Edna and Michael 
for being inducted into the Academy of American uh, Arts and Sciences. I want to congratulate the Academy of American Arts and Sciences for choosing such estimable uh, and remarkable people to induct. And um, uh, Bob, Bob asked us to uh, perhaps choose something of our own to read and something of Michael's to read, and that's, that's what I've done. And I wanted to choose um, something both of my own and of Michael's that had to do with, uh, with a couple, uh, a married couple. And uh, my poem uh, is called The Rehearsal, and it's about um, uh, a married couple of musicians. And this is a poem about their very first experience together before they were married. Um, the Rehearsal. At our first rehearsal, Bach's B minor sonata was what we played. I already knew this young woman interested me. We borrowed a room, where was it? With a harpsichord, whose? And with few words began the sonata. As this unfolded, recognition, confirmation, accord, consternation. Above all, the marking of a common center. She had told me Bach was her favorite composer, her home site. But by the end of the first movement, I knew that in her case, this was not just devotion to the music, its spirit, its generosity, but a trust in it, a willingness to let it speak. What I heard at the same time in that first movement is the loneliness that often inhabits the undertone of a great master's work, the habitation of a realm so rarely visited with so little company to find that secret in music the performer needs an inner life, a kind of solitary experience. I sensed a person for whom art costs too much, for whom the sharing of that intense experience with others is often painful and risky. I knew what that might be like. I sensed joy, possibility, danger, complication, inextricability, a fulcrum, a magnet, a talisman. We began the second movement. I hope some of that rings true for the two of you. And this is a poem by Michael that I love um, and that I think um, I've been trying to find the words, um, the right words. There's a profound delicacy in Michael's poems. There's a kind of understatement that is so deep it's just incredibly moving. I, you've already heard some examples of that this evening. And this is a short poem called The Pattern. 36 years to the day after our wedding when a cold figure revealing wind blew against you and lifted your veil 
I find in its fat envelope the six-shilling vogue pattern for your bride's dress. Complicated instructions for stitching bodice and skirt. Box pleats and hems. Tissue paper outlines semblances of skin which I nervously unfold and hold up in snow light for snow has been falling on this windless day and I glimpse your wedding dress and white shoes outside in the transformed garden where the clothesline and every twig have been covered. The next reader is Owen Doyle. Hi, I first met Edna and Michael after Michael's reading in March at the Boston Public Library, and then I had a great pleasure of having lunch with them, with Joanne Baldine at the MFA. And in that very, very short time, I experienced firsthand the warmth that uh, Michael evokes in his epigraph to his book, Man Lying on a Wall. No insulation, a house full of drafts, visitors, friends, its warmth escaping, the snow on our roof the first to melt. I very much felt the Longley's warmth in person, and I think it escapes from everywhere in Michael's poetry, even dark poems about violence, sometimes handled with a very generous wit, as in his poem, Fleance. The speaker is an actor playing Fleance in Macbeth. He has only two short lines, he escapes from the assassins who murder his father, Banquo, and then he disappears from the play. Fleance. I entered with a torch before me and cast my shadow on the back cloth momentarily. A handful of words, one bullet with my initials on it, and that got stuck in a property tree. I would have caught it between my teeth, or a true professional stood still while the two poetic murderers pinned my silhouette to history in a shower of accurate daggers. But as any illusionist might unfasten the big sack of darkness, the ropes and handcuffs, and emerge smoking a nonchalant cigarette, I escaped, only to lose myself. It took me a lifetime to explore the dusty warren beneath the stage, with its trap door opening on to all that had happened above my head, like noises off or distant weather. In the empty auditorium, I bowed to one preoccupied caretaker and, without removing my makeup, hurried back to the digs where Banquo sat up late with a hole in his head. And now to uh, make a diptych of actor-speaker poems, here's one of mine. Off left. Ropes to hoist and lower skies hang barely visible in the spill of artificial twilight behind black velour legs that rise into the dark. Mouthing lines to recall things I have yet to do, I shake my arms to conjure a state that mimics readiness and listen for my cue. It never comes. The actors pass, bloodied, lightheaded, faces smeared with the dust of their strutting deaths. They smile at the thunder that just now hailed tonight's achievement. Unseen, they will change out of these lives and into others, while I, I will wait right here, not too far from the props table at the foot of these escape stairs. The house goes dark. I hear the distant click of the last door. Another day's portrayal's done, and once again I stand at my place in the wings, all set for the show tomorrow. And the next reader is Kelly Matthews. Thank you. 
I was lucky as a young writer to be in Michael's workshop class in Trinity College, Dublin in the spring semester or Hillary term as it's properly called in 1993. Michael had just published his collection Gorse Fires, his first book in 10 years and winner of the Whitbread Poetry Award. As our writer in residence, he lived in rooms on the college's cobblestoned front square, retracing his own steps as a Trinity student years before, he told us, when he had first come to Dublin and when he first met Edna. Our five-person class gathered each week in his living room to talk for hours about our own writing and the writers we admired. And often midway through the evening, we relocated to Bo's pub and continued talking until last call. Michael said he hoped we would find vocation and proportion, a sense of vocation for ourselves as writers and a sense of proportion for writing's place in our lives. And I believe these are ideals that he and Edna embody together. That summer, through their generosity, I was able to travel on scholarship to the John Hewitt Summer School that Edna was then chairing at Garen Tower in North Antrim. And that is a landscape I came to know well since I stayed on that coast another year to work at the Corimilas Peace Center and later returned to live in Northern Ireland with my husband, Ronnie, another Ulsterman, and our two sons. So in recalling that place and those times and with gratitude to Michael and Edna, I'd like to read first John Hewitt's poem, Landscape, followed by Michael's poem, Gorse Fires. Landscape by John Hewitt. For a countryman, the living landscape is a map of kinship at one level. At another, just below this, a chart of use, never at any level a fine view. Sky is a handbook of labor or idleness. Wind in one ert is the lapping of hay. In another, a long day at turf on the moss. Landscape is families, and a lone man boiling a small pot, and letters once a year. It is also underpinning this good corn, and summer grazing for sheep free of scab, and fallow acres waiting for the lint. So talk of weather is also talk of life, and life is man and place, and these have names. Thank you. <laughs> and Gorse Fires by Michael Longling. Cattle out of their byres are dungy still. Lambs have stepped from last year as from an enclosure. Five or six men stand gazing at a rusty tractor before carrying implements to separate fields. I am traveling from one April to another. It is the same train between the same embankments. Gorse fires are smoking, but primroses burn, and celandines, and white may, and gorse flowers. Our next reader will be Fred Marchant. I hope that I speak for all of us when, we say, when I say that you turn the pages of Michael Longley's poetry and you suddenly find a poem you've never read before and suddenly it pierces you deeply in the heart and it stays with you and you want it to be with you for a long, long time. Welcome both of you to this. I'm going to read one of those poems of Michael's. At High Wood. I picture my gentle dad at Highwood, lying wounded among the splintered trees and unburied dead, some of them his mates, some his victims, shot and bayoneted. Many Trojans and Achaeans fell that day and lay side by side, faces in the mud. 
as an American writer or in person even, it's hard to know, to have in the mind the series of um, battlefields of World War I, and I thank Michael for giving me those in the heart. This at Highwood. Highwood was one of the battles in World War I at the Battle of the Somme. Just for the record, 8,000 fatalities at Highwood. The last two lines, of course, as you all know, Michael is a master at layering um, uh, classical Greek and Roman civilization into our lives and, and in his poems. And the last two lines are from Homer. I'm going to read two very short poems that I hope capture, or at least have some cousinhood to that kind of gentle, clear-eyed, ferociously clear-eyed um, um, poetry that I just read. The second poem is by Nguyen Chai. Nguyen Chai was a 15th century Vietnamese writer, a man who was a commander, a courtier and a commander in war, and was also a, a great poet and a poet who retreated to the Mount the Khon Son Mountains, south of what is today Hanoi. And um, this is called Occasional verses at Khon Son after the war, and it's co-translated by myself and my friend Nguyen Bachum. Occasional verses at Khon Son after the war. Ten years away from what I knew and loved as home, I returned to pine and chrysanthemum grown rampant to patient streams and trees, wondering where I've been. I am covered in dust. There was nothing I could do. Now that I'm home, my life seems nothing but a dream. The war may be over. I may be alive. But I want nothing Nothing more than a cloud-tipped mountain, good tea, a stone pillow. And the last poem is by me. It's called The Migrants, and it's an epigraph from Hesiod's Works and Days, and it refers to uh, Prometheus um, stealing the fire. The Hesiod remark, uh, line is, he hid the fire in a hollow stalk of fennel out of the sight of the great one who delights in thunder, the migrants. In those mountains, he met others walking in the same direction, backpacks, black plastic garbage bags, food sacks, a girl with two hard-boiled eggs, the shells flaking off. Some wore t-shirts from the sports teams of the West, and one man still carried an orange life jacket. The hunted, wayward God stood beside a mother who held her infant before her, the same way he held the stalk that carried the embers he had stolen. He noted dry myrtle along the side of the road and saw a ground that seemed soft enough for them to sleep on. There would be at least this much tonight, twigs for a fire, perhaps water for tea, some warmth in the morning. The next reader is Meg Tyler. When I had a stretch in Belfast three years ago, I was accompanied by my daughter and my son, and my daughter was enrolled at Queen's University. Um, it's probably no surprise to you that Michael and Edna were incredibly generous to us, so much so that when my 20-year-old daughter had to write a paper for her anthropology class called Love, Hate, and Beyond, the Longleys willingly allowed her to interview them. In a section of her paper entitled Data, Presentation and Analysis, she wrote, 
M, because she wasn't supposed to say their names, M began our visit by saying that love poetry was like the hub of a wheel. All other subjects, nature poetry, friendship poetry, etc., were like the spokes that extended from the hub. So I want to read two love poems about Michael and Edna by Michael. Um, when my daughter asked Michael about the secret to a long relationship, he answered, marry someone more intelligent than you are, which is what I did. <laughs> Everything Edna says is interesting. We listen to each other. Edna once said, intelligence listens, and that's part of the secret. These are two little poems from Angel Hill. The Necklace. Long ago, I compared us to rope makers, twisting straw into a golden cable. Here is a necklace marking 50 years. The straw rope has turned into real gold. And here is his poem, 50 Years. You have walked with me again and again up the stony path to Carrick's Kiwan and paused among the fairy rings to pick mushrooms for breakfast and for poetry. You have pointed out like a snail shell or a curlew feather or mermaid's purse the right word silences and syllables audible at the water's windy edge. We have tracked otter prints to Aloran and waited for hours on our chilly throne. For 50 years, man and wife, voices low, counting oyster catchers and sanderlings. The next reader is Andrew Sofer. On behalf of Boston College, I'd like to warmly welcome Michael and Edna. It's just an honor and a treat to have you both with us this evening in support of the Poets Theater. For me, uh, Michael's poetry exemplifies what a character in Muriel Sparks, the prime of Miss Jean Brody, calls the transfiguration of the commonplace, a phrase later taken up by the great philosopher of art, Arthur Danto. In the snow hole, a big double bed becomes a snowscape. In the goose, an egg becomes a seamless cranium. In the pattern, which Lloyd just read so beautifully, a snow-covered clothesline blooms into a long-ago wedding dress and white shoes. In the shaker barn, a circular wooden hay barn seen from a mouse-eye view becomes the shaker's cathedral. And when the self-described pagan poet imagines a christening in his poem font, thanks to the cleansing fountain of poetry, all waters are holy waters. I've chosen to read Michael's short three-part poem, Cathedral, from Gorse Fires. This poem juxtaposes Ovidian metamorphosis, transubstantiation, and the poetic translation in the poem's own term of one figure into another. I'll follow it with my own poem, also called Cathedral. I'm not sure if that's a full rhyme or just a chime, but that poem is a meditation on new love inspired by the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which I could glimpse from a window almost 30 years ago. Cathedral by Michael Longley. One. Between the bells and prayers, a flower seller calls prices and flower names, the dome translates to echoes, as though a pigeon had flapped in from the piazza and perched on the chalice and sipped the sacrament. Two. Because it was dragged on a cart to the cathedral by untamed calves, the wooden body has emerged from candle smoke and incense and, dressed up as God, moves through the market 
to locate those animals. Three, the puppy, supposed to suggest a faithful wife, has nearly nipped her toes for centuries and begs to be taken for a walk outside this building where stones eat flesh and moonlight eats the stones. Cathedral, Washington, D.C. I discover the cathedral through bare trees that only a few weeks ago were full, but shed a mottled canopy of leaves. Sitting at your oak desk, I feel the pull of these new days spent leaning into you, testing the weight of silence against words. A narrow window offers me a view of quiet air and a crow's nest where birds settle between two branches like a Y. The faint throb of a jet arcs overhead and vapor cloud furrows a field of sky with white that thickens in a hazy spread. Behind each constellation of ourselves lie others. I look around our cluttered space and wonder if by emptying the shelves of all we've gathered here, we might erase this sky, these trees, this window, or this love. The cathedral starts to meld with violet light, seeping through late afternoon mist. Above stone towers, martins dart and wheel in flight, then blur lost in a climbing purple stain. Perhaps a haven is what love requires, as when, ducking into marble naves past rain, we hear a steeple bell through hollow spires. The next reader is Suzanne Matson. Welcome, Michael and Edna, and uh, thank you for the bounty of both of your careers. Uh, when Bob Scanlon asked us to choose a poem of yours, the choice was really difficult. Every poem was an invitation. Every poem had its beauties. Every poem shared a sense of quietude and fullness and precision and apparent simplicity. Um, under which was great craft and subtlety. Uh, I, I finally gravitated toward cloudberries because I'm, it's set in Lapland and I'm descended from Finns on my father's side. Cloudberries. You give me cloudberry jam from Lapland, bog amber, snow line tidbits, scrumptious, Cloudberries sweetened slowly by the cold and costly enough for cloudberry wars, diplomatic wars, my dear. Imagine us among the harvesters, keeping our distance in sphagnum fields on the longest day when dawn and dusk, like frustrated lovers, can kiss, legend has it, once a year. Ah, kisses at our age. Cloudberry Kisses. And though I have a Lapland poem, uh, I finally settled on one of my own that hinges to Michael's uh, by virtue of having a traveler in a new land, a delicacy from the place, and a kiss. It's called Squid. The way to eat squid is to catch it first. Best if you pull it out of the dripping net yourself, a gift you didn't ask for, from among the ordinary bone-filled catch you did, and the purple sea stars, inedible bad luck you didn't deserve. Next, to eat squid, you waste a fire to coals, nestling the flaccid bodies into the earth for as long as it takes, usually long. Finally, you may eat the small, charred legs, 
one by one, working your way to the ink-filled heart. This is a shared humiliation, and at this stage, you are obliged to press your lips to any nearby lover. Mark him as indelibly as you can. <laughs> the next reader is Daniel Tobin. No poet I know of renders the natural world in relief of the human quandary with such impassioned delicacy as Michael Longley. No critic I know of embraces traditions of literary excellence with such consummate insight as Edna Longley. It is a great honor to be honoring these two this evening, these extraordinary writers. I'm gonna read two poems. The first is a poem I love very much by Michael Longley called The White Butterfly. I wish that before you died, I had told you the legend, a story from the Blaskets about how the cabbage white may become the soul of one who lies sleeping in the fields. Out of his mouth, it wanders and in through the eye socket of an old horse's skull to explore the corridors and empty chamber, then flies back inside his lips. This is a dream and flowers are bordering the journey and the road leads on towards that incandescent palace where from one room to the next there is no one to be seen. When I asked you as a child how high should fences be to keep in the butterflies, blood was already passing down median and margin to the apex of a wing. And this second poem, I hope, lifts somewhat on a longly wing. This is called The Bone Flute, and it's about the first human instrument discovered in the Ock Valley in Germany, what is now Germany, the bone flute. Reedless, rimless, this woodwind owes its timbre to a wingspan. It's quiet to millennia, played like tenons for the planet's long riff. The man who notched this V to a mouth hole, drilled these zeros for keys, did so for the consort, the ones who huddle out of phase amidst the flint and sediment of their own low-hung cave astride the Danube's bedded plains. From Ach to Bach, the one amplitude, single envelope of sound on the human frequency. So raise beers and bravos to this primeval session in honor of the goddess, buxom and big sexed in the snug of the earth. Its stalactite timpani, mammoth tusk bassoons, its wind chime spear points and to the unknown genius of this lithic whistle, his breath primed and pitched through the wing bone of a bird that might, just as deftly, with a beak fashioned by luck or by a score more elegant, have plucked his own bones clean. The next reader is Greg Delante. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a poem of Michael's. Uh, there are lots of poems. Uh, it's, it's probably the first poem that I loved of Michael's that broke the ink barrier and I was inside behind the ink when I was about 17, 18 or 19, I can't remember. Um, and it is called um, Swan's Mating. And it is, of course, Even now, I wish that you had been there, sitting beside me on the riverbank, the cob and his pen sailing in rhythm, 
until their small heads met and the final heraldic moment dissolved in ripples. This was a marriage and a baptism, a holding of breath, nearly a drowning, wings spread wide for balance where he trod, her feathers full of water, and her neck under the water like a bar of light. I envy that bar of light. Jesus, it's a beautiful thing. Like. Um, I envied it in 1718, but no, I just, anyway. I mean, I was a little boy when I met, uh, in college, uh, I remember going up to ask uh, Michael for her poems for the college magazine that I was editing, and I remember Mike said, I haven't written a poem in eight or nine years. I can't remember, you were reading with Douglas Dunn. Anyway, I was only a little boy, but now we're nearly the same age. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read um, a great poem by, uh, from the Greek Anthology, Book 17, by Longlius. Oh. Wish you were here. As we drove through the countryside, dry, as the donkey's back that a grizzled man rode into the infinity of the mountains, nothing was so spectacular as the purple and white oleander, a local called Picrodaphne, nonchalant about their picture postcard, nonchalant about his picture postcard flower lining the roadway. His eyes are dulled by what is under the purview of the God familiarity. If only we thought of ourselves as tourists riding our planet, circling our heavenly star, writing postcards to ourselves, beginning, having a wonderful time, this place is paradise, truly out of this world. It was a good poem, Michael. And um, I, I'm going to do something perhaps improper. Um, oh dear, maybe I'm not. Um, but. Um, Michael just told me, you know, before I came in that, um, and I know that Michael is bound, bound is probably the right word to say something about um, Karen. And um, this is a later poem which I have Karen doing in. Um, Karen Carson died yesterday, so there's a reason for me reading this because partly, um, Though we all have our difficulties, and often we have difficulties between ourselves. <laughs> WBH talks about um, um, that all is worked, all the poems, each poem is really just one long poem, but it is also true that all of the poems that all of us are writing, the successful ones or the ones that work, are also one poem. Um, a new law, and I, I know that Michael, Michael ran the Arts Council in Northern Ireland, apart from being, I, I don't know what to say, Northern, and, and, and Michael, uh, Kieran did too, afterwards. A new law, let there be a ban on every holiday, no ring in the new year, no fireworks doodling the warm night air. No holly on the door. I say, let there be no more. For many are not here who were here before. And um, 
I'm going to just finish now with a, a kind of a poem I wrote today. Or, well, actually, I, I, I wrote a, an unsuccessful poem for Michael's birthday, which Michael never saw. Or it, it, nah, but um, I kind of grabbed it together today. So it's, it's a very un, poem that hasn't come into focus yet. But it, it gets better what I have to say if I said it now. Because it's very hard for us all to show credit um, and love and appreciation to both Michael and Etna. And it's a bit embarrassing for them, no doubt, which is why Etna probably is delighted to have our back to you and our head down. <laughs> we have never learned, to t we can take criticism, but we could never take the, the criticism of praise. Uh, it's very hard for us all. Anyway, this is uh, Michael and, um, and, and Etna came down to Kerry to stay with us for a few nights, and then came down late. It was the first time, at the same time. It's called Kerry Lily, a very rare plant, and you can't, it's only found in Derry Nan, of all of Ireland, not nowhere else. The Kerry Lily, to Michael Longley, which it was to his birthday, but it goes in, no, I've changed it, to Michael and Etna. The next time you pay us a visit on our end of the island, you, Etna, I, and Dan, if he's around, will meander the shore for the sight of one. Michael, it would be great if you would recite the names of the local wildflowers we come across. Like that last afternoon, we doddered over the rocky dune moat to Abbey Island. The moody, carry light made gold of the sand below Kumakishta, pass of the treasure. A sun shower highlighting you, reciting your litany by heart. Sea bindwind, sea sandwort, mather, bird foots trefoil, hoary rock cress, yarrow, ladies bed straw, barnet rose, white clover, juniper, lesser skull cap, chaff weed, the spiky white flowered marum, sea holly, sand sedge, couch grass, the dwarf willow. Part two. I had to write it down today and I, can't, I couldn't read my writing in the, in the train. Excuse me. Part two. After you left, I checked out the names of Squelga in Irish, in Gaelic. After you left, I checked out the names, Ask Welge. How about these? Bedstraw, Blochnish, Scent of Skin. I, I named the, the, the English, then the Irish, then the, then, the, um, then the translations of the Irish. After you left, I checked out the names, Ask Welge. How about these? Bedstraw, Blochnish, Scent of Skin. A willow, brimfar, fart grass, yarrow, ahar, talin, father of the earth, chaffweed, fall garabiog, small cheat, sea bindweed. Plur on Frona, Prince of Flower, spent F L O U R. A, a proofreader, surely, a proofer, surely, but after checking, no, a type of, named, I suppose, uh, for the buried stem holding the fl flower of the silk stand, sand together, protecting us. All. Ah, right, now. Sorry, I couldn't read my story. Ah, right, now, Michael. You know how I could get figurative here and all too easily. But we are glad you are now being crowned the royal couple in the kingdom of Bindward. <laughs> there you go.
sorry. Next reader is Edna Longley. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't usually do this kind of thing, but who could resist a chance to be part of the legendary Poets Theatre? Uh, so, as a general tribute and a, a thank you to this muster of poets, um, I'm going to read Michael's poem, The Poets. That is, The Poets poem beginning with a line of John Clare. The poem is a sonnet, and it takes its imagery from Carrigskewan on the South Mayo coast. And this poem, which begins with John Clare, ends with an allusion to Seamus Heaney. The poet's poem beginning with a line of John Clare. Poets love nature, and themselves are love. Imagine an out-of-the-way cottage, close to dunes, the marum grass whispering above technicolor snails and turns eggs. Intelligent chuffs on the roof at dawn, at dusk whimbrels whistling down the chimney, and Outside the kitchen window, that cliff, where ravens have nested for 50 years. Moth and butterfly wing decipherers, counters of Connemara ponies and swans. Along the lazy beds at the lake's edge, they materialize out of sea mist and into hawkbit haziness disappear. One has written a lovely blackbird poem. The next reader will be Michael Longley. Well, this has been terrific, really. I've believed every word of the praise. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to sit in the... I'm going to read for about... I'm reading about six or seven poems, okay? Um, you're gluttons for punishment, really. <clears throat> um, and thank you, Boston College, and, of course, uh, the Poets Theatre, and uh, the wondrous uh, Bob Scanlon, who makes things happen. Now, Edna, that, that was a, a reference to, uh, to Seamus. And I'm going to begin with a poem which uh, uh, salutes Callimachus, who was a third century BC Greek poet, and he wrote a famous poem to Heraclitus, an elegy for Heraclitus, not the great philosopher, but a minor uh, Greek poet. And uh, there's a wonderful um, Victorian translation of it by somebody I, I don't know anything about, except for this, uh, William Curry. Uh, they told me Heraclitus, they told me you were dead. And uh, the poem is set in, in Balachi. Uh, where, where, where Heaney is buried. <clears throat> Sedge warblers. Callimachus joins me at your grave, who shed tears for Heraclitus and said his poems were nightingales that death would never lay hands on. There are no nightingales in Ireland, but sedge warblers sometimes sing at night and are mistaken for nightingales. So death that snatches at everything will leave untouched in Balachi your poems, the Sedge Warbler's Song. And 
I'm, I'm just going to read all of these poems are new ones, and uh, I sent in my my next collection um, last month. Um, so slightly shy uh, uh, reading these, and it and I heartbroken uh, that Karen died yesterday as we were flying to to Boston, and uh, I started what we call traditional arts in the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, which was mainly Irish music. And uh, it was an education, but it was gradually beginning to wear out my liver, because in those days, all the, all the young musicians now drink Ballygan uh, water. In, in those days, uh, the Irish music was launched on a tidal wave of alcohol, and I asked, uh, I needed a, a, somebody to take over uh, to be my assistant, and uh, uh, fortunately, Kieran um, was appointed. And he, as a result of getting to know, well, he knew them anyway, he, he spent all his time with Irish musicians, and that would be bedtime, you know, at about four or five. So he wasn't a very good timekeeper in the Arts Council. And the, the director, when he wanted to get at me, which he often did, would call me down uh, to complain about Kieran's timekeeping, and, which I objected to. Uh, so about the fourth time this happened, I said, well, Ken, you know, Kieran has a problem. And he said, what's that? I know he wanted me to say he drinks too much. But I said, no, he has a problem. He's a genius. <laughs> and here's a poem. So I thought that was funnier than it. <laughs> uh, I was um, 80 last July and uh, there was this marvelous gathering of some of our children and some of our grandchildren in the cottage uh, at Corrigsky One and surrounded by the birds that mean so much to me. And uh, the river, the little river is called the Oan Adornon, beautiful name. And uh, I refer to the burial mound, which I've often written about, but it's no longer there but it exists in my, in my memory and mind. This is a kind of sonnet, birthday party. I turned 80 at Corrigsky One, with grandchildren at the table, and in the townland around us, wheat ears and dapper stone chats, and far more lapwings and curlews than I expected, a snipe or two, ringed plovers in the middle distance on Taliban strand. And where the Owen Ardonon used to meander, sandpipers nervously warming their four eggs. Wind removed the swallow's nest. We shall walk hand in hand beyond where the burial mound once was. And I don't really welcome uh, visitors there, but there's this wonderful painter who now lives in the north called Geoffrey Morgan, and he came down about 15 years ago uh, when I was there on my own, and I, I took him for a walk along Taliban Strand, and he was a tiny from Blackheath originally, and I, it was a very sandy, windy day, and um, I said, Jeff, uh, look out there, and there were dolphins. I said, they're dolphins. He thought I was joking, but there they were. And I said, I, I think the karma is right. If you can bear the long walk through the sandy wind and sitting on a rock at a Laren point, I think we, the karma's right. We might see an otter. And so we, we, we arrived at a Laren, and um, we sat down, and within about five minutes, 
a bitch otter came within as close as that chair is to me and a very beautiful creature and I'm sure she must have heard our hearts thumping and we stood up to stretch and as we stood up to stretch the uh, a family of five Hooper swans came and circled above us flying from Iceland to Korrigsgewan and these were d three divine revolu uh, revolutions and if Geoffrey hadn't there hadn't been there, nobody would believe me. <laughs> that's, that's what this poem's about. Now, you have to wait to the, near the end of the poem for the main clause. Uh, that's part of the excitement of the poem. It was, <laughs> it was also part of the excitement of uh, writing it. The Walk for Geoffrey Morgan. If you hadn't come all the way with me along Taliban strand, when I pointed out bottlenose dolphins surfacing between the islands, and suggested they might foretell an otter if we could brave the sandy wind, and wait for an hour at a laren point. And after only minutes, a bitch otter paused on rocks just feet away, sea water streaming from her whiskers, our thumping hearts audible, surely. And as we stood to stretch, a family of Hooper swans, two white and three grey, circled above our heads on their way from Iceland to Korrigsgewan. No one would believe these three visitations. And you quipped, what's next then? And yes, old friend, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next? Well, one of the things that was next <coughs> was in July, I, I, I brought down uh, some Homer books and I engaged in, in conversation with, with, with Homer and uh, I wrote five uh, refractions, I call them. They're not exactly um, translations, but he's a, it's our first great European masterpiece. And uh, as I say to the students, poetry had to change after Homer. And it did change, but it didn't get any better. And that's a bit like J.S. Bach, isn't it? Music had to change after J.S. Bach, but it didn't get any better. Um, anyway, uh, here's a kind of uh, shaggy sonnet um, about Achilles on the rampage. I've called it, ironically, glory. Just as through the gorges of a parched mountainside all-consuming fire rages and incinerates deep forest, blustery winds whirling flames about. So with his spear, Achilles like a god rampaged, crushing his victims, and the black earth ran with blood. And just as a farmer yokes broad-browed bulls to thresh white barley, on his well-appointed threshing floor, and the loud bellowing bulls quickly husk the grain beneath their feet. So beneath almighty Achilles, the heavy hoofed horses trampled corpses and shields, and blood guts churned up by horses' hooves and wheels splattered the axle tree and the chariot rail. But the son of Peleus plowed on in his glory quest, his indomitable hands be spattered with gore. In other words, war is a very bad idea. And <clears throat> I turned uh, to the other great Homeric masterpiece, the Odyssey, and uh, for years, I'd wanted to write about Moli, uh, Hermes 
gives um, Odysseus a mysterious herb, which is an antidote against the spells of Circe. And I'd wanted to write about that for a long time. And I was looking out across Clue Bay to Inish Turk, lovely island, and I thought Inish Turk could be Ithaca. And that was the poem. And this is another kind of sonnet. Um, and it's about moving with some relief from the blood-stained Iliad and the daft rage of Achilles, let's face it, to the Odyssey and Odysseus. Anyway, here's the poem. Translating the Iliad at Corrigan, Book 20, Achilles' Rampage, I turn to the Odyssey for relief and stroll from my sheepskin armchair down the overgrown pebbly path to search among goosegrass and centaury and scarlet pimpernel for that milk-white flower with black root so difficult for mortal man to find, occult herb and antidote for spells, Circe's spells. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but I shall recognize it if it's here. Its name among the gods is Moli, and Inish Turk becomes Ithaca. Now, I'll read the last, I think it's the last, uh, just two more. Um, yeah, two more. Um, last, a year ago, last July, I won, I'm very proud of this, I won the inaugural um, Yakamochi medal, which was awarded um, by the Toyama Prefecture in, in Japan. And uh, 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 Otomo Yakamochi uh, lived from 718 to 785, roughly about 1,300 years ago. And he was a celebrated poet and politician. And this is a conversation I have with him uh, and his landscape and my soul landscape of Korogskiwon uh, are in sort of kind of conversation over, over 13 hundred years. I think it speaks, speaks for itself. But um, dear Kieran, whom I mentioned earlier, he used to pull my, pull my leg about, right, he called my, he talked about my wee poems about primroses and swans. And uh, when I was wondering why on earth these, these Japanese had awarded the, the the prize to me, I realized that we poems about swans and primroses are what the Japanese like. Um, so, so here's the poem. It's called uh, To Otomo Yakamochi, and uh, its subtitle, I have to repeat, is On Receiving the Inaugural Yakamochi Medal. You, Otomo Yakamochi, poet and governor, and I, minor bureaucrat and poet too, meet across 1,300 years to talk about birds and flowers. Lover of cuckoos and wisteria, for you I have saved meadow sweet and willow herb and loose strife, and the meadow pipit's few notes and the skylark's aria. We gaze on our soul landscapes more intensely with every year. Small boats passing, passing in Ishbofen, small boats on the Nago Sea, Wakami River, crimson lustrous. Barnacle geese are messengers across space and time, Otomo, torment till closed by the rain and century, tiny boxes, yellow and pink, Japanese. 
Anything, however small, may make a poem, a snail, say, tucked into the marum grass. In the distance, Tatayama or Mwilre, holy mountains. I picture you at the white strand, galloping through the breakers, springtide and rain and spray kicked up by your horse's hooves, drenching bridle and stirrups. A small townland <coughs> becomes my life. Corrigs go on, grandchildren wading in the tidal channel. Otomo, my soul's a curragh, disappearing behind the waves. And um, to close, and to thank all of these poets and friends uh, for saying such kind things um, about Edna and me. I do listen to everything she says. And this is a, a refraction of the earliest poem in Irish, um, supposedly by Amergan, the, the legendary bard of the Ulster cycle. He wrote a poem which goes something, you know, I am wind in the sea, I am an ocean wave, I am a hawk on the cliff, etc. And this is my uh, refraction and version of that. And some of my literary friends uh, don't know what a holt is, where otters live, or a set, S-E-T-T, -T, which is where badgers live. And thank you for listening and for this huge honour, uh, which I shall be processing for a long time to come, and I don't quite know uh, what to say or how to express my, my, my gratitude and uh, my, uh, not only my gratitude, but also my, gratitude, my, my deep affection for, for Bob. After Ramagan. <clears throat> I am the trout that vanishes between the stepping stones. I am the elver that lingers under the little bridge. I am the leveret that breakfasts close to the fuchsia hedge. I am the stoat that dances around the erratic boulder. I am the skein of sheep's wool, wind and barbed wire tangle. I am the mud and spittle that make the swallow's nest. I am the stone chat's music of pebble striking pebble. I am the overhead raven with his eye on the lamb's eye. I am the night flying wimbrel that whistles down the chimney. I am the pipistrelle bat at home among constellations. I am the raindrop enclosing fairy flax or brookweed. I am water lily blossom and autumn ladies tresses. I am the thunderstorm that penetrates the keyhole. I am the sooty hailstone melting by the fireside. I am the otter's holt and the badger's set in the dunes. I and the badger drowning at spring tide among flotsam. I am the otter dying on top of the burial mound. Thank you very much. <clears throat>